Hello and welcome to this lecture on The Birds by Daphne du Maurier. I am Arden Hegley. I'm a professor in English and Comparative Literature at Columbia University, where I also teach in the Department of Medical Humanities and Ethics and in the Medical Humanities major at the Institute for Comparative Literature and Society. Um, I'm very grateful to be invited to give this lecture by Amy Catania, the Executive Director of Historic Saranac Lake at the Saranac Laboratory Museum, and Mahala Nyberg, the Museum's Public Programs Coordinator, um, to give this lecture on Daphne du Maurier's novella, The Birds. Thank you so much for inviting me to speak about epidemics, and especially at this location, which is globally important in the history of the treatment of tuberculosis. The lecture I'll be giving today is adapted from a course that I taught at the height of the first wave of the COVID-19 pandemic, and the course was called Epidemic Fictions. And what was notable about that class was that it was taught to medical students who were enrolled in narrative medicine at Columbia Medical Center. So I'll begin by telling you a little bit about what it was like to teach about epidemics in the first wave of COVID-19, and then to think more generally about why we read the literature of past pandemics at all. And then in the second part of my talk, we'll get more into Du Maurier's text, The Birds, and think about how it teaches us something, perhaps unexpectedly, about pandemics. So first, oh, my slide, here we go, here we go. So first, um, let me tell you why I find it interesting and useful to read pandemic fiction based on the experience I had with medical students. When COVID-19 gained full sway over New York City, students at Columbia's medical school lost their clinical electives as a measure intended to keep them and their patients safe. Um, they were no longer allowed to go into the hospital to complete their clinical training. The students were asking themselves, well, here they were, nearly qualified as medical doctors, but shut out of the hospital. How are they going to find purpose in a pandemic in which they were unable to make a clinical contribution? And more prosaically, how are they going to graduate on time? So enter the gift of narrative distance. If students couldn't be helping out in the wards, they might find value in encountering the pandemic at a remove through literature. And then they could also earn their course credit to graduate and become doctors. Um, so it was that in March 2020, I found myself designing a mini course called Epidemic Fictions that I would teach again to different groups four times that year. Um, together, my students and I asked, how do the tools of the humanities, historical reflection, critical inquiry, and attention to feeling injustice, help us to make sense of what we're experiencing? And what could encountering epidemic and its global correlate pandemic in fiction afford us? We began by considering how contagious disease was represented in literature from the ancient world, uh, including some of the very oldest literary texts that we've inherited in the present day. Uh, even humanities scholars like me forget that the two most important works of ancient Greek literature, Homer's Iliad and Sophocles' Oedipus Rex, both begin with a plague that's a form of divine punishment. Why should it be, we wondered, that for these classical texts, the middle of things in Medias Race that launches the plot would be an outbreak of disease? It's actually there in Homer on the very first page. Apollo sends a plague to the Greek camp as punishment for kidnapping the daughter of his priest. And the image you see on this slide is the father, the Apollo's priest, pleading with the god to please send the plague to attack the Greek camp. Um, in both the Iliad and in Oedipus the King, the unseen but deadly contagion seemed to draw a connection between bad political leadership and proof of the existence of the gods. Um, here's a picture of the plague of Thebes with um, Oedipus being led by his daughter Antigone. Again and again in ancient literature, these are the metaphorical hallmarks of contagious disease, bad politics and divine origins. What you start to notice uh, when you read about contagious disease in classical literature is that epidemic seems to be uniquely effective as a narrative device. Because you don't know you're in an epidemic until you're, you're already in the middle of it, you are forced to consider in Homer's words at the opening of the Iliad, what is, what will be, and what happened before. What is this illness? How did it come here? And what will happen next? And this reminds us of the literary device of in medias race, in the middle of things, that characterizes so much of ancient literature. 
texts that start not at the beginning of the story, but once it's already begun. The story of epidemic always starts in the middle of things. Yet what we learned about epidemic from classical writing doesn't always hold true in later periods. When my class read pandemic fictions from the medieval and early modern periods, um, the epidemics in those texts took on a different hue. For the great Italian novelist Boccaccio, the plague of Florence that he personally lived through in 1348 is described in really dismissive terms. Although over half the population of the city died in a single summer, Boccaccio just calls it a brief pain. Illness for him is just a pretext to flee from the stricken city and to distract oneself through storytelling. You might think about parallels with the activities of privileged New York City residents at the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic, but more than this, you can think about the rise of the novel as, as spurred by pandemic escapism. Um, Boccaccio is one of our first great novelists, and um, it has been argued that without this uh, pressing experience of uh, pandemic, he would not have come up with the literary genre that he did. Um, so what new genres and forms might arise creatively out of our own pandemic moment, you might ask yourself. Another text worth mentioning, Daniel Defoe's The Journal of the Plague Year, bends our expectations of fiction by including an almost obsess obsessional statistical catalog of death rates from the 1660 Great Plague of London. The book pretends to be a history, even though it's a novel, but even more strangely, Defoe's novel seems to eerily predict 2020's collision of pandemic urgency with a demand for police reform by testifying to how the Great Plague of London was managed by magistrates and policemen and very little by doctors. Um, what we learn from pandemic fictions like Defoe's is that medicine is just one actually fairly recent tool for controlling contagious disease. Um, very curiously, relatively recent portraits of epidemic in literature, those written in the last hundred years or so, have done something different with contagious disease. They have invoked epidemic on a symbolic rather than a literal level. In these stories, disease isn't just disease, it becomes a metaphor for some other kind of social ill. And we can speculate why this is, um, perhaps with the rise of germ theory in the late 19th century and the rise of new sanitary techniques for controlling the spread of viral and bacterial infection, it might be that epidemics have become less of an urgent concern and more a reason for imaginative speculation. Um, but there are obvious exceptions to this of major pandemics in the 20th century, like tuberculosis, polio, and HIV. So the theory only goes so far. Um, one telling example of this new trend towards seeing epidemic as a metaphor for something else is Thomas Mann's early 20th century story, Death in Venice, um, which is a chilling account of lassitude in a public health crisis that points to pandemic's history of nationalist stereotyping. The cholera that Mann depicts in Venice isn't just a literal and historical disease, although it is partly that. Um, but also it's disturbingly an emblem of sexual sin associated with urban diversity. Um, in rather a different register, Albert Camus' World War II novel, The Plague, uses disease as a thinly veiled allegory of Nazism, using the metaphor of bubonic plague to chart uh, the writer's own experience of being in the French resistance under Nazi occupation. Um, even more speculative fictions like Edgar Allan Poe's The Mask of the Red Death from the late 19th century, um, leave realism behind, but manage to capture even more persuasively the psychological reality of living through epidemic, and especially our psychological tendency to represent an inhuman threat in human terms, something I'll be returning to in this talk. Um, it's this supernatural strand of pandemic fictions that um, we'll be thinking about in a minute when we start talking about the birds. So back to my story, um, once my medical students read all of these texts together, we came up with a different answer to the question that we started with, which is why do we read the literature of past pandemics? Together, we found that by reading literature about contagious disease written by different people in different places over millennia, we can encounter the reality of epidemic in a strange way that in fact enhances our understanding of the present day. The students in my course experienced a powerful and collective transformation by encountering echoes of their present reality in the distant past. With their stories of quarantines, stay-at-home orders, essential workers, and rule breakers, these historically distant texts felt urgent and immediate. 
By reading the literature of past pandemics, we can recognize the power of storytelling to communicate something fresh about our shared experience, something different from simple reporting. It might be too much to say that we can gain wisdom and insight in our response to COVID-19, uh, but in entering the alien worlds of epidemics through the ages, we can find aspects of our reality that are unerringly familiar. So with that background, I would like to turn to a specific instance of pandemic fiction, The Birds. This is a novella, which is a short novel, um, written by the great British suspense writer Daphne du Maurier. And though it was originally published as a short story in 1952, it's even more famous for the movie that Alfred Hitchcock made of it in 1963, which set the story in California instead of in a little rural corner of England. So the birds might seem like an unlikely choice for a pandemic fiction, but I think it is a really interesting example of how illness can be turned into a metaphor. In a way, it's a curious reversal of other texts I mentioned, where epidemic is a metaphor for something else, like Camus' novel, The Plague, where bubonic plague, which Camus represents realistically in all its gory detail, um, isn't just a contagious disease, but is also a thinly veiled representation of Nazism. What we have instead in the birds is a radical departure from a realistic portrayal of illness. And rather, we move into the realm of horror, where disease isn't represented as itself exactly, but manifests entirely in other symbolic forms. In Daphne du Maurier's story, pandemic isn't actually represented as an illness at all. Instead, our protagonists are faced with an unknown, catastrophic, world-encompassing, pathogenic onslaught that basically has all the hallmarks of a novel virus, except that it's birds, kamikaze birds who court death in their desperate attempts to attack humanity. Why birds? So this very basic question, um, in fact, leads us to a deeper question for today, um, perhaps our main question when we read the text which is what does metaphor have to tell us that realism cannot? And then relatedly, what new insights can the supernatural afford us? And by this, I mean insights both into the nature of epidemic, but also in the nature of the human response to it. One answer to this, and what I'd like to argue in what follows is that the birds is using the motif or the symbol of kamikaze birds as a literary technique of what a critic would call defamiliarization. So I want to spend a little time on this. The idea is art can make us see the familiar in a new way by making it unfamiliar or uncanny to us. As the writer Anais Nin says, it is the function of art to renew our perception. What we are familiar with, we cease to see. The writer shakes up the familiar scene and as if by magic, we see a new meaning in it. Or as the ancient Greek philosopher Aristotle said, literature must appear strange and wonderful. As with the other pandemic fictions that I mentioned before, we can see illness in, def in a defamiliarized way simply because of the historical remove or because of the writer's insistence that epidemics are the consequence of offending the gods or of bad political leadership. But with the birds, defamiliarization is operating in an even more capacious way. Du Maurier is representing illness not as itself, but through the symbol of the birds in an extraordinary creative act of defamiliarization. So for us to get into this, um, let me tell you a little bit of background detail that you might wanna know uh, about the literary genres and devices that Du Maurier is playing with and calling up as she crafts the story that we read. Um, you might begin by asking yourself, what are your initial reactions to this story? Is it a familiar one? At first, this seems like a very realistic and even mundane story. It begins in a fairly modern, if not exactly contemporary setting in post-war England on the Cornish coast. It has a realistic opening, locating us in a date, time, and place. The story deals with rural people in a homely environment. Um, note that there are council houses. This is low-income housing created after the Second World War. At the heart of the story is a nuclear family of a father, mother, and two children, boy and girl, um, both of whose names start with the letter J. Um, the main character, Nat Hawken, is an everyman protagonist with whom it's very easy to identify. Yet, despite or perhaps because of this familiar feeling opening, um, this is a classic work of horror and suspense. And as an early 20th century novelist, Du Maurier was known for her talent in writing thrilling and suspenseful material. 
One critic wrote of her in her obituary. Jamori was mistress of calculated irresolution. She did not want to put her readers' minds at rest. She wanted her, riddle, her riddles to persist. She wanted the novels to continue to haunt us beyond their endings. And it's that sense of indeterminacy, that haunting that makes the birds continue to have such power for us today. And let's look at the opening of the text. The story is set in Cornwall in rural Western England. And this is a mythologically loaded landscape. Uh, this is Tintagel Castle in the um, image. This is traditionally King Arthur's seat. This is the West Country, far from the urban center of London. And actually all of Dumouriez's works are set here. She herself lived there as a recluse. So in the very setting of the story, there is an opposition being drawn between depraved urban life, which is something that comes up in lots of other pandemic fictions, but also the moral uprightness of rural folk. So I'll just read the opening of the story. On December the 3rd, <laughs> I'm recording this lecture on December the 3rd. On December the 3rd, the wind changed overnight and it was winter. Until then, the autumn had been mellow, soft. The leaves had lingered on the trees, golden red, and the hedgerows were still green. The earth was rich where the plow had turned it. Nat Hawken, because of a wartime disability, had a pension and did not work full time at the farm. He worked three days a week and they gave him the lighter jobs, hedging, thatching, repairs to the farm building. Although he was married with children, his was a solitary disposition. He liked best to work alone. It pleased him when he was given a bank to build up or a gate to mend at the far end of the peninsula where the sea surrounded the farmland on either side. And then at midday, he would pause and eat the pasty that his wife had baked for him and sitting on the cliff's edge would watch the birds. So this is the first appearance of that fateful word, birds. Um, I have a few little comments about the passage. Um, first, this is very traditional, classic English landscape. Um, it's almost Wordsworthian, the English romantic poet Wordsworth, with the allusion to the green hedgerows. This is hedgerows. Um, this is a reference to some of the most famous landscape poetry of English literature. It's setting the scene in almost a, a pre-urban, pre-modern world. Um, and this sense is reinforced when we think about the portrayal of Nat. He seems to emerge from the landscape almost as a kind of primeval man um, doing ancient forms of farm work. Uh, the Cornish pasty is a traditional delicacy of the region. It's like an, you know, um, an indigenous dish. So um, the overall sense here is that it doesn't feel as though this story is taking place in the modern world, except for that reference to the wartime disability. So um, from this very open-ended ended beginning, the text takes a horrifying turn as the birds very incrementally turn on humanity. Um, one question that you might want to answer for yourself as you read is, how does the text achieve its feeling of extraordinary creepiness, this burgeoning horror? And the answer that I come to when I ask this of myself is that it's like the very best horror movies. It feels so realistic and so normal that the supernatural element, when it's introduced, is extraordinarily insidious and jarring. The progress of the birds is so carefully documented that it's easy to lose track of when the story departs from the bounds of realism. And the horror of this work is achieved through, as I said, a very incremental, realistic introduction of the birds that progresses to the full disintegration of society. But crucially, each step along the way is shown as a natural outgrowth of what came before. So first, we notice a change in the weather, a hard winter. Second, more birds are visible. And next, the birds begin to tap at the window. And then, ah, uh, the bird draws blood. Birds come into the house. Birds attack children in the house. Birds begin gathering outside, waiting to attack in daylight. Birds do an overnight attack and come down the chimney. Birds bring down aircraft. Birds kill people. Birds kill all of society. The urban centers and communication channels are shut down. And finally, civilization has disappeared and the family is presumably doomed. So as you see, the progress of the story leaves the bounds of realism, but the narrative is so tightly controlled that the invasion of the birds continues to feel extremely realistic as we progress. So as background, I wanted to mention three literary devices that Du Maurier uses to achieve this effect of encroaching creepiness. So the first is called the sublime. 
This is an aesthetic idea that dates back to the 18th century, um, formulated by a critic called Edmund Burke. And it basically goes like this. Um, when we experience terror without any sense of immediate danger to ourselves, like when we stand near but not at the edge of a cliff, our mind experiences the sublime or what Burke calls the strongest emotion which the mind is capable of feeling. And the idea of the sublime is that being close to the end of danger is tremendously thrilling and exciting. Actually being in danger is very scary and upsetting, um, but we experience a form of pleasurable terror if we experience danger at a slight remove. Um, this feeling of the sublime is something that Du Maurier brilliantly achieves in the text because we're reading about the horror of the incursion of the birds at a remove. They're not actually breaking our windows. We enjoy the threat as we experience it vicariously through Nat and his family. And the sense of enjoyment is something that I think is worth paying attention to in thinking about the birds as a defamiliarization for witnessing a pandemic at a remove compared to actually being in it. Notice when and where people start to feel a sense of enjoyment when they have a vicarious experience. Okay, the second literary device that Du Maurier uses to achieve the story's creepy effect is what the great English poet Samuel Taylor Coleridge called the willing suspension of disbelief. And though this phrase is very familiar to us now, it was coined by Coleridge, who was one of the great romantic writers and an expert in the genre of the supernatural. And in fact, he talks about these um, supernatural birds as well. So he's a very good uh, precedent for this. Um, Coleridge suggested that if a writer could infuse what he called human interest and a semblance of truth into a story, the reader would suspend their judgment about whether the narrative was realistic or not. The idea of the suspension of disbelief that we as readers are willing to let go of our real world knowledge um, that birds really can't form an army to attack humanity. Um, and if we just accept and enjoy Du Maurier's story for what it is, um, this is based on the idea that even in supernatural or horror genres, there's a kind of human interest that grounds the narrative in what's emotionally rather than factually true. In Du Maurier's story, we get this human interest through the narrative's vocalization in the character of Nat Hawken and his family, the prototypical nuclear family with whom we can identify. All right, the third and final literary device that Du Maurier employs to achieve the creepy feeling of the story originates actually not from literature, but from psychoanalysis at the beginning of the 20th century. Um, this is a concept developed by Sigmund Freud called the uncanny. Freud coined this term in a 19, 1919 essay called Das Unheimlich, which um, though it's, we translate it into English as the uncanny, uncanny um, it literally means the unhomely, uh, like what doesn't belong in your home. Interesting, right? Um, and this, uh, the original essay of Freud's explains why dolls in particular are very eerie. Um, they're both homely of the home, but also kind of unsettling and disturbing. Um, so for Freud, the uncanny locates what's strange in what's ordinary. And Du Maurier uses this very well. Um, for her, a typical site on the English coast, which is seabird circling, becomes an opportunity to make the familiar strange and to have it become fresh and unsettling. This concept of the uncanny is most closely related to the idea of defamiliarization that I mentioned before. By representing the birds as uncanny rather than familiar, Jumoria makes them strange and creepy. Um, meanwhile, by representing all the tropes of epidemic disease through the symbol of birds, she achieves an effect of defamiliarizing illness so that we look both at illness and at birds in a new way. So those are three underlying literary devices to keep in mind as we think about the birds and how it defamiliarizes illness for us as reader in the uses of the sublime, the willing suspension of disbelief and the uncanny. So I wanna turn now to talk about symbolism. And throughout this lecture, I've been talking about the birds as if they are a clean cut symbol for a novel contagious disease. And the text supports that reading to a great extent. Um, the human race is threatened with a heretofore unknown, globally destroying, life-taking enemy that's also strangely not cognitive. Um, it's a non-thinking pathogenic opponent. All this makes drawing an analogy between the birds and pathogenic illness 
pretty easy. And for me, this is a really relevant way of reading the text, but surprisingly has not been done very much before. Um, but taking the birds as a symbol beyond the analogy with disease allows for an even richer and more nuanced reading. So as you read this text, one point you might ask yourself or discuss with others is what do you think is the significance of the birds? Are they a metaphor or symbol? And if so, for what? So I'll mention now just a few ways in which the text has been read by readers and critics over the years. Um, it has been read as an allegory of the Cold War. Um, the story was written post-World War II in a Cold War environment. You might notice all of the allusions to the Arctic Circle, to the words the East Wind, which appears 10 times, to Russia. The birds gather on the water like a mushroom cloud. Nat hopes that the army and Navy will take care of the birds. That's his default for, you know, what will solve the problem. Um, there are interesting parallels with what had actually happened historically in England in the Second World War. Um, all of the protocol and training that Nat uses to find a shelter, um, his expectations around government response emerges from this immediate post-war context. It was not thought like air raids in the war. No one down this end of the country knew what the Plymouth folk had seen and suffered. You had to endure something yourself before it touched you. So we have this immediate post-war reality that's informing the text. Um, taking this into an entirely different register, um, one sort of standard way of looking at a horror story like this one um, is sort of like Frankenstein. Um, where a very easy reading to do is it's humankind that's the real monster. Um, but what's interesting here is that what holds true for Frankenstein may not actually hold true for this text. You might ask yourself, can you imagine a reading where the birds are the protagonists and the humans are the enemy? Is, is it humanity that's the real monster here? And actually in the film adaptation, Alfred Hitchcock does just this. Um, here we have a scene where kids are eating chicken and saying, are the birds gonna eat us, mommy? Um, it, it really points to that irony um, in the film version. So the story might also be an invitation to reflect on what's wrong with the human heart and with the human treatment of nature. And it poses the hypothetical question, what happens when nature fights back? All right, and lastly, we come to the suggestion that I have, which is that the birds could be understood as equivalent to an epidemic. You might want to consider this and debate it with your colleagues. You can agree, disagree, counter propose. I would be very glad to hear your ideas around this point if you want to get in touch with me. All right, so, uh, certainly the text does give us a picture of a world in extremis, what might be called a state of exception, where normal rules break down and humans are called upon to live in a new order. I find it productive to consider what similar features are present in this text that you might also have perceived during the early phases of the COVID-19 pandemic, especially lockdowns. Uh, for instance, this text is quite interested in the role of government. Nat says early on, someone should know of this, someone should be told something was happening. And so here he's appealing to a nameless authority since there's a discrepancy between what he's hearing and what he's seeing as an eyewitness. Shortly thereafter, he says, see to the windows and the chimneys too, like they tell you. He's blindly following instructions. He's taking what he's learned during World War II in the Blitz, and he's applying it to quite a different situation. The story shows a gulf between urban and rural life and the question of personal versus collective responsibility that also feels very reminiscent of our own pandemic moment to me. They ought to do something, says Nat's wife. Nat thought to himself that they were no doubt considering the problem at that very moment, but whatever they decided to do with London and the big cities would not help the people here 300 miles away. Each householder must look after his own. How are we off for food, he says. And so to me, this passage is very suggestive of a kind of triumph of old world thinking over modernity because Nat says, you know, we'd be better off in the old days when women would bake bread twice a week. Um, notice in the story that the post-war council houses are no match for an earlier cottage. Um, so one question you might ask yourself is, is this story a prepper's fantasy? And is it a vindication of that kind of mentality? Or in contrast, um, what, if any, is the role of community in the text? <laughs> 
The issue of collective responsibility has proven to be extremely important in our own pandemic and its collision with individual rights and responsibilities has been a political flashpoint. So the way that Du Maurier's story settles its answer on this point is worthy of further thought and discussion. It might not be the conclusion you expect. Relatedly, Nat finds consolation in his faith in the expertise of others. So you might consider discussing expertise. And um, when he's taken refuge in his home and he hears the crashing of aircraft during a reconnaissance against the birds, he tells himself, there's one thing, the best brains in this country will be onto it tonight. Somehow the thought reassured him. He had a picture of scientists, naturalists, technicians, and all those chaps they called the backroom boys summoned to a council. They'd be working on the problem now. This was not a job for the government, for the chiefs of staff. And they would merely carry out the orders of the scientists. But what does it mean when this belief proves to fail, when the experts don't come to the rescue? Later in the story, now and again, he would look up searching the sky for aircraft. None came. As he worked, he cursed the inefficiency of the authorities. It's always the same, he muttered. They always let us down, muddle, muddle from the start. No plan, no real organization. And we don't matter down here. That's what it is. The people up country have priority. They're using gas up there, no doubt, and all the aircraft. We've got to wait and take what comes. Another question worth considering as we think about how we imagine a novel virus and its symbolic representation in the birds is whether the birds are motivated by an evil force or whether their actions remain inexplicable. And so here I wanted to turn to um, a literary device called prosopopoeia, which is attributing human motive to an inhuman thing where abst uh, an abstract thing is personified and rendered human. We do this all the time when we think about COVID variants trying to predict what the virus is doing and what it will do next. Um, likewise, in the birds, Nat regularly attributes human motives to the birds. Even at the beginning, he mentally notes that they are joining with one another in their urge for battle. They have a kind of militaristic behavior. Next, a madness sees them with the east wind. Later, Nat gives a human motive for their bizarre behavior. He says, fright made them do that. When he notices that the bigger birds are absent from the local attacks, he thinks they've been given the towns. They know what they have to do. We don't matter so much here. The gulls will serve for us. The others go to the towns. So here he attributes human motives to the birds. He suggests military coordination and an army-like force. Um, they progress in his estimation, becoming ever more human. He says they've got reasoning powers. They know it's hard to break in here. They'll try elsewhere. They won't waste their time with us. And yet, near the end, there's this very bizarrely contrasting sentence where we're reminded of the profoundly inhuman nature of the birds. Now listen to the tearing sound of the splintering wood of this door that the birds are breaking into and wondered how many million years of memory were stored in those little brains behind the stabbing beaks, the piercing eyes, now giving them this instinct to destroy mankind with all the deft precision of machines. So here we're suddenly thrown back into a conception of the birds as evolving, animated by a force that's impossible for the human mind to understand, but they're also kind of mechanistic too. So again, this is a point for reaction and discussion. Um, can we attribute motives to the birds? And does it work to understand them as a human-like enemy? And when do we notice ourselves attributing human motives to non-human opponents like viruses? Where do those analogies begin to break down? And um, finally, it's worth spending some time thinking about the ending of the novella, which is rife with indeterminacy and indecision. Nat says, I'll smoke that last cigarette. Stupid of me, it was the one thing I forgot to bring back from the farm. He reached for it, switched on the silent wireless. He threw the empty packet on the fire and let it burn. Ask yourself, what do you think is the significance of the cigarette and the burning packet? What future awaits Nat and his family? The text is unresolved on this point. So at the end of the novella, we are left with a feeling of irresolution and suspense. It is a cliffhanger moment, to borrow our earlier image of the sublime. We're suspended at the edge of the cliff, but we haven't quite gone over. Um, where I'm left at the story's end is asking, what can we understand about our own experience through an encounter with the story's defamiliarized rendition of an encroaching natural threat? 
What does a story like this teach us that a text that is explicitly about disease wouldn't? And can a distorted version of an epidemic narrative teach us something new? I think you know by now, I think it can, um, but you might consider yourself which symbolic elements of the birds speak most strongly to you in relation to our own experience with COVID-19 and whether the story has anything to teach us about how to respond differently to the challenges that lie ahead. So to sum up, my argument in this talk today has been to suggest that we can think about our own pandemic differently by using texts like the birds as lenses through which to observe human behavior when faced with a novel but different threat posed by nature. I've argued that we might learn different things through literature than we might through simple reportage because of the creative power of defamiliarization. So as a final writing exercise, you might wish to broaden your own perspective on this point with a free writing activity borrowed from narrative medicine. So the exercise is, with a pen and paper in five minutes, pick something familiar and write about how epidemic has defamiliarized it for us or made it uncanny. And then when five minutes are up, share your observations with your friends and colleagues. Thank you very much for your time and attention. And I'm very grateful to you uh, for listening to my lecture.